Okay, I want to uh, uh, share what I've been preaching, Christ living in me. And um, I want to, as I put the, uh, review the points, I, I want to clarify. I felt very uneasy, and I felt the Lord correct me, if you can put it like that, with a little clarification of what I preached last Sunday. And it's very important to me that I rightly divide the Word of God. Very important to me. You don't know how important it is. It's really important to me that I rightly divide the Word of God. Clearly be clear about what I preach and teach because I'm going to stand before the Lord someday and give an account for everything I preach here. And so the Lord wanted me to clarify, not so much to preach wrong, but so much to clarify uh, what I preach because it wasn't clear. And so I want to go back. Uh, but before I do, uh, I, this is what I preach so far about Christ living in us and what that means. It means the living Christ, the Son of the living God, as Cookie talked about him today, the Son of the living God, Christ himself, by his Spirit, is living in me. Let that, think about that. Think about that. Christ himself is living in me. Living in me. 24-7. Not a minute does Christ ever leave me. He's constantly, continually living in my spirit. Isn't that wonderful? And so what does that mean? It means that I should be fellowshipping with this living Christ, right? I should be listening and obeying this living Christ in me. I should be looking to Christ and trusting the living Christ because he's all-powerful. I should be overcoming with Christ because he's the overcomer and he lives in me and he's the overcomer. I should overcome with him. He's living in me. I should be reaching out to others like Jesus did and still is. And last week I shared Christ living in us meant we should be serving Christ. And uh, we should be serving him because he served us. Do you remember I shared that with this? But I was a little unclear about this whole thing. So I gave a diagram came to me. <laughs> and so I had to share it with you. So I'm going to put it on the screen to clarify what I preached last week. If I can put that up there. And so let me just explain something and clarify. So it's very important that I preach the truth and preach all of the truth. This whole thing about Jesus serving us and us serving with Christ. Before Jesus, the Son of God, before he came down to this world, he was the eternal Son of God. He never had a beginning like our Jehovah Witnesses teach that God the Father created God the Son. That is error, that's heresy. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit always existed. The Son of God never had a beginning. That go back to the ancient Christian creeds and everything else. And I believe that, and the Bible teaches it clearly, that he is the eternal Son of God. He was always there and always will be. Amen? He was God Almighty and still is God Almighty and equal to the Father, equal to the Son. He's the eternal Son of God. Well, the eternal Son of God, what we call the humiliation of, G of Jesus, of the Son, I keep saying, Jesus is his human name, okay? The eternal Son of God became Jesus. The eternal Son of God became a servant, thulos, which means bond servant, slave, lowly servant. It speaks of his relationship when he was on this earth. Even though he still was the eternal Son of God, he never ceased to be the eternal Son of God. But he took upon himself a form of a servant. The thulos is the Greek word, which means he was a bond servant. He became a lowly servant on this earth. And he ministered, he served. And it's a different Greek word. It's the akonos. The akonos. Uh, it's an emphasis on the second syllable. The uh, I'm trying to put it in English. The akonos. And that means he served. He ministered. That's the New Testament word. Because he was a servant, took upon himself the nature of a servant, he ministered to people. Aren't you glad he ministered to us? 
and he ministered, the, the best ministry was he went to the cross. He served us at the cross. Amen. Amen. He served you and me at the cross. He gave himself. After his death and resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, that's what that is, we call that the exaltation of the Son of God. He is no longer, and this is what I want to clarify, and this is where I was a little muddy last week. He is no longer the thulos. He became a lowly servant in this physical body, and he served. Now that he has been ascended to heaven, he's still the eternal Son of God. He was the eternal Son of God on earth. He's still the eternal Son of God, who now is on the throne, ruling as king. Some people say he will be ruling. No, he's ruling now. He's king now. He's ruling invisibly. Someday he will rule visibly upon the new heaven and new earth. But he's the eternal Son of God ruling, but now he is ministering I put, put a little space between ministering and serving. You can see that. If you can do that uh, back there, that would really be great between G and S. But he's ministering and serving still today, not as a doulos, but he's ministering and serving as the eternal Son of God and as King from a different perspective. He ministered on this earth while he was a doulos, a servant, a lowly servant, he ministered, even though he still was the son of God, and he ministered to people, and so should we. Amen? Amen. And now he's been exalted. He's no longer, and this is what I wanted to clarify. I kind of led, I led it, it was a little muddy in my teaching and preaching. He is no longer thulos. He is now king. But he's still ministering, but from a different perspective. How many understand that? So he's ministering and serving as king down to this earth via Holy Spirit. Everybody say, via Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's how I wanted it, yeah. Terry, you do, she does such a good job, doesn't she? Amen. Amen. Now he's ministering via Holy Spirit to us and to this earth. We believers should emulate Jesus by a position. We are thulos. Say, I'm a thulos. <laughs> Quit calling me names, Pastor. Well, you are a thulos. <laughs> you are a servant. You are a servant. You are a servant of Jesus. All of us. We're thulos. We're, it's a relationship to God. We are his, we are servants of the King of Kings. And now we as thulos are to continue the ministry of Jesus who, had, who was on the earth, we continue his ministry with the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jesus did most of his works except like forgiving sin, he was God. I believe the Holy Spirit came upon him and he did, after that he did the works of God. It's showing us an example. We as servants now, we need the Holy Spirit to come upon us and fill us so we can be ministering like Jesus did. That's why our evangelical brethren, I love them, I love them, I love my fundamental Baptist brethren. You don't know how much I love them. I love their emphasis on soul winning. But they're missing this element. They need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to come upon them to do the supernatural works of Jesus. And so us now, we need that holy, same Holy Spirit that came on Jesus. Us, who are thulos, that's the singular. I'm not going to go into plural and all that stuff. We now are ministering as the akonos. We are to minister. That's the word. That's the word, by the way, we get our word deacon from that word. That's where we get our word deacon. We are to minister the akonos, deacon. We are to minister the grace of God to others on this earth like Jesus did. With him. With his spirit. Amen? Amen. Is that clear? Okay, just wanted to clarify that because it's important to me to rightly divide the word. And if I'm, I'm not clear, I will tell you I wasn't clear. I, you know, it's more important for me to correct anything and to make it clear uh, and because I want to rightly divide the word of truth. Thank you. Let me go on. <laughs> Christ living in me. What does that mean? Christ living in me. 
Christ living in you. Say that with me. Christ is living in me. Christ is living in me. Say it again. Christ is living in me. What should that mean? What does that mean to me? What is my responsibility? What are, what the, what are the uh, responsibilities? Uh, what's my responsibility to that? Well, seventh responsibility, you want to put it, is Christ living in me, Christ living in us, means we should be confessing Christ to others. Jesus said, Therefore, whoever confesses me, it's a continual tense, by the way, you don't confess Jesus just once. You continually, whoever, if Christ is in me now, whoever confesses me, whoever's confessing me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him I also will deny before my Father, Father who is in heaven. Christ living in me means, because he's living in me, I should be confessing this wonderful Christ who is living in me. I should be confessing this Christ who died on the cross for me, gave himself completely for me. This Christ who pours out his grace in my life. This Christ who loves me unconditionally. This Christ who forgives me. This Christ who's working inside of me. This Christ who's working through me. This Christ who will never leave me. This Christ who is committed to me. This Christ who loves me more than anybody else. This Christ in me. I should be confessing him. He's not ashamed of me. He went to the cross, this loving, wonderful Christ, this, this Christ who's all powerful, this Christ who's all loving, this Christ who's all compassionate, this Christ who's all forgiving, who's living in me, I should be confessing, 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 and confessing him to everybody. Are you a confessing Christian? Why is this so important? Well, because he done so much for me. That's one reason, right? Let me give you another reason. I don't understand it, but when I'm confessing Christ and I get in the habit of doing that as a lifestyle, I defeat the devil. Romans, I mean, Revelation 12, 11 said, they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Three ways they defeat the devil. By the blood of the lamb, how many left for the blood? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Isn't that interesting? When you confess Christ, you defeat the devil in the lives of other people and in your own life too. You defeat him. I don't know how that works out in the spiritual realm, but all know no, this is when I'm confessing Christ, something has happened supernaturally in the lives of other people, even though I don't see it. The enemy is being defeated in the kingdom of darkness, and he's doing something in my life, too, when I'm confessing Christ. So I should be confessing him, because the devil's defeated. Don't you want to defeat the devil in your life? Confessing Christ means many things, but confessing Christ means first and foremost that you confess him as your personal Lord and Savior. That if you confess with your mouth what Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. As a Christian, there's no such thing as secret believers. Everyone that Jesus calls, he calls publicly. The reason why many Christians today in different countries are being martyred, because they talk about Jesus. <laughs> and remember when they told the disciples, no, we don't want you to uh, speak that name anymore, and they said, too bad, they did, right? And they got thrown in prison, and they, and they were per persecuted, and you're gonna get persecuted. Bobby just shared with me what happened to her on the bus about, she said, ask somebody if she can pray for his, something about his foot or his ankle, whatever, and he got all mad and he cursed her and everything else. Well, sometimes people, very unusual when you ask for prayer for healing, but sometimes it happens. I remember one time I was witnessing to somebody in the house and it was all nice and fine. As soon as I said the blood of Jesus, he got mad, he got up, and demons are coming out of his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I want you to get out of here and I don't want to hear any more of that stuff. He's got red faces. Well, because he didn't want to hear it. That was nice and left. But you understand that sometimes that means some opposition, right? 
But that's all right. You don't wait for, you don't look for the opposition, but understand that opposition will come because the enemy does not want you to confess Christ to others. Now, some Christians say, well, I confess Christ to others by living my own life, my good Christian life, and being a witness by my life. That's half the truth. Yes, our witness, our life witnesses to the fact that we are different. But they still need to hear the word of the gospel. If, I, if someone was sick in a, in, a, in a disease ward and everybody was in their wheelchair and, and, and they all were sick and they, they could, there was no remedy and someone comes in with a remedy and gives it to one person and he takes it and he said, wow, all of a sudden he's feeling strength in his legs and he gets up, pushes the wheelchair all around and showing everybody that he's, that he's healed and look at this and he's pushing the wheelchair and he's walking all around and they see that something is different. They know something happened. But if he doesn't say how he got the remedy, they're going to know he's healed but they're not going to know what the source is. We need to share with the source. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. This should be our lifestyle. Confessing Christ should be our lifestyle as a Christian. We should not be ashamed of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said in Romans 1.16. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. When you start to confess Jesus in the gospel, there is power in that gospel. There's different ways we confess Christ. We confess Christ by sharing our testimony, how Jesus saved us. We confess Christ by giving the gospel out. We confess our Christ by power of evangelism. We pray and see the power of God, but then we tell them about Jesus. That's how they did it in the book of Acts. We confess Christ by giving out booklets. Amen. We confess Christ in many ways, but we got to get the word out, guys. Amen. Are you confessing Christ? And we need to confess him in these last days as the only Savior. Amen. It is amazing to me how many believers, this was not an issue when I first got saved, how many believers today, I'm talking believers in Jesus, truly saved, somehow believe that some people that are genuinely sincere and they're sincere in their religion that somehow God will bring them into heaven because they believe in God and they believe what they, have, have, they think they should believe or whatever. They're sincere in what they believe that somehow, believers, somehow God will let them in. I've talked to many believers. That is a lie from the enemy. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but through me. Right from the lips of Jesus. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hear me out. I personally believe when 2 Thessalonians talks about the lie of the last days, of the lie of Antichrist, which I see more than one person, the lie in the last days will be this. The lie will be that everyone can go to God, because everybody believes some, some kind of God, in your own way. Many roads up the hill. I was witnessing to my dentist, <laughs> and he said that. There's many ways to the airport. That's how he put it. I said, I have to beg to disagree with you. I said, Jesus said, since you believe in Jesus, you told me you believe in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say I am a way. So I believe the lie will be, and listen to me what I'm going to say. The lie will be, not everybody's going to believe the same in some false religion like some have taught. No. It's going to be some kind of unity whereby this, and I remember going to a, a uh, um, I can't think now what it was, at some kind of a service, and the, the minister up there prayed, 
Oh, and God, man, you're known by so many different names, and he went spill the God of Hindu, God of this, and God of this, and God of this. And so in other words, you pick your God's name, right? And so, and we all, oh, that's our unity. We all believe in this one higher power, and uh, you can call what you want to call that higher power. And so we all pray, and we all say the name, and that's okay. And if you don't believe that, if you're so narrow-minded and so bigoted that you believe that Jesus is the only way, you're out of it. You're, you're cruel. You're mean. You're a spiritual terrorist. Mark my words. That will be the lie in the last days. That those that don't believe that there's only one way to, the, to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and if you believe that, you're going to be outside the mainstream. Hear me out. I say that, and I know in my spirit, I'm speak, speaking the truth here. That will be the lie. The lie will be you can believe what you want, as long as you believe in a higher power, and let's all come together, like in the Tower of Babel. Let's say, let's all come together. Remember that? Let's all build ourselves a name, and they all built it. One, to one tower to it went up to God, and what happened? God scattered it. It's the spirit of globalism today. One government, one belief system, one monetary system, and the deception that all can believe in this one God. That's the big deception, the false prophet. And beloved, I'm saying this for a reason. Count it right now that you're willing to suffer the persecution and whatever that persecution is, whether it's mockery or whatever it is, that you confess that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. If it wasn't, that cross is all in vain. If all can get together without the cross, then Jesus died for nothing. But Jesus did die for something. The only way to God is through the blood of Jesus Christ and faith in that blood of Jesus. Beloved, you're going to be challenged in your own family. You're going to be challenged at work. You're going to be challenged everywhere about this. I'm telling you. Jesus is the only way to God. We need to be confessing that. We need to be confessing that Christ is our total sufficiency and satisfaction. We need to be telling people for me to live as Christ. And as you heard the song, that Christ is sufficient. Christ meets my needs. Christ is help, will help me through troubles. Christ will be there when I go through this trial. Christ will be there when I'm going through the sickness. Christ in me means I can do all things through him. Christ in me means he can give me the strength. We need to tell people Christ is sufficient. He's not just going to take us to heaven. Praise God for that. But Christ is sufficient. He is all I need. That's a song said, right? And so he is, and we need to tell him he satisfies. Nothing, we need to tell people, nothing will satisfy your soul. Nothing will fill your soul than Jesus. <laughs> we need to confess he's our sufficiency. Confess, confess, confess. Are you confessing Christ to your to your specific world, the Lord has called you and me to confess him. When it says go into all the world and preach the gospel, it doesn't mean that I'm supposed to go to every person on the face of the earth. It means I'm to go to my world. You have a world of family, friends, fellow employees, fellow students. You have a world, do you not? You are called, Christian, to confess Christ in your world your family members your relatives people you work with people you go to school with that's your world the Lord has called you to confess Christ because there's power in confessing Christ that's why the enemy hates it he hates that he wants tape over your mouth <laughs> and you know when you start confessing Christ in your world Supernatural things happen. I asked Lewis if I can use him and Esther as an example. But Lewis and Esther came forward in our church. I remember you guys came down this aisle. Am I right? This aisle. You gave your whole life totally to the Lord. 
What, you know what year? 2001, 18 years ago. Since then, they've been witnessing and confessing Christ to all their family members. When I say family, I don't mean immediate family, but relatives, cousins, aunts, cousins, uncles, everybody. And I was asking Lewis right before the service, how many, what percentage of now of them are, are saved, have accepted Christ? He said 80%. 80%. Eighty percent. That didn't happen just by saying, okay, if, if, sure, you pray for them, right? The Lord will work on them. But by confessing Christ. Confessing Christ. Confessing Christ. Faith comes by hearing. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. Start confessing Christ. I did that. My first person was my dad. I had the privilege of influencing my dad to salvation. I led my grandmother to the Lord. I led my aunt to the Lord, praise God. I'm trying to lead my uncle to the Lord. <laughs> and the Lord put on my heart something to do this uh, in the near future. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to talk to him not just about spiritual things, but about other things. You know what I'm saying? About health. and I, He's into health, okay? And he looks at every label when he buys it. He looks at every label. Well, how much sugar does this have? How much is You know, he looks at every little label. He's more conscious. He's more concerned about his body than most Christians are. We're the temple of God. We should take care of this temple, right? But anyhow, what I, the Lord's put on my heart, I'm going to send him a book. One Minute After Death by Lutzer. It's a good, powerful book. And I'm going to send him a book, and I'm going to write him a little letter. And what the Lord told me to put in there, Lester, Uncle Lester, I love you. I want you to spend eternity with me. I don't know if you know this. I don't think he knows this. But when your mother was toward the end of her life, I had the privilege of leading your mother, my grandmother, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and she accepted Christ as her personal Savior. I don't think I ever told him that. I just thought about that. So I'm going to tell him that. But before that, I asked him, can you give me the recipe for Greek lentil soup? <laughs> no, there, you, uh, what do we say in Greek? The lentil soup. Fakis? How do you say lentil? The lentil soup. You know lentils? How do you, is there, well, anyhow, the lentil soup. <laughs> Where there's a, there's a, if you haven't ever tasted it, it's beautiful. It's, a, it's got a lot of stuff in there. It's good, healthy food for you. Well, anyways, I'm going to ask him for that. For, um, I already did send him that. Because I want to talk to him not just about spiritual things. Understand that, beloved, right? We've got to talk to him about other things. And he's a Cardinal fan, so John doesn't want to talk to him because he's a Cub fan. He's a St. Louis Cardinal. I said, how'd you end up a St. Louis Cardinal fan? He said, I don't know. When I was in the service, I started hearing about him, and I, I became a Cardinal fan. So he's a Cardinal fan. And so I, I want to talk to him about other things, and I talked to him. I can't believe he runs, still runs four, four times a week, and from here, to, from Elmo Park to the expressway, he's in his 80s. Man, it's unbelievable. He's just a spe specimen of health. And so I want, to, I, want, I want to go to my world. You have to go to your world, Christian. You're called to your world. How have you been doing? Have you been confessing Christ in your world? I'm challenging you. Have you been confessing Christ in your world? Power evangelism, testimony, however you want. The Lord uses many ways, right? Sometimes the power of evangelism is, he doesn't use it because sometimes the people need to hear love, right? So you've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, how to approach people. But you need to open your mouth and confess him publicly. I got, to share a test, I got to share something that happened to me this past week. It's a beautiful thing. I'm coming down. Those of you who know Chicago, you know what I'm thinking. I'm coming from Jewel on the northwest side down Irving Park Road to Oak Park Avenue, if you can visualize some of you. And I'm making a turn on Oak Park Avenue coming home. And on the corner is a boy about 15 years old, something like that. I guess around 15. I see that he has a little boom box or something. Okay? And I see him with a microphone. I said, what's he, is he singing or what? So I rolled down the window and I'm coming up to the corner and I hear him preaching, preaching the gospel. He's saying, uh, and there's teenagers around him, there's adults around him, and I want to let everybody know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, the son of God, came, I mean, he gave it straight. He came into this world and he came to the world for one reason, to die on a cross for our sins and to be raised at the end. And salvation is free, for by grace, for by grace are you saved through faith. And he's preaching away the gospel. 
boldly, 15 years old. How many 15-year-old kids do you see doing that? Oh, we need teenagers to get up and say, boldly, I belong to Jesus. And he's preaching away, and the teenagers are listening to him. Adults are listening to him. But boldly to preaching the gospel. So I was turning the corner, and I said, preach on, brother. And he said, oh, yes, thank you. I thought that was such a blessing. 50, how many 15-year-olds here preach the gospel? How many adults preach the gospel? Boldly. I don't have to go on a street corner. I'm not saying that. But we need to be bold and with love. Both. He had love in us. You can tell he was full of love. He's, he was full of joy, too. Full of joy, love, everything. <laughs> I mean, you can see the man, the young boy was lit up. He was excited about Christ. I wanted to stop the car and go. I should have stopped the car and went over there. But, but <laughs> there's just kind of, but I encouraged him by yelling out to him. And everybody heard me yell out, too. So, but praise God for that young boy. Amen. That just put something in me and said, Nick, you need to be bold. Confess Christ. We can do it. We can be uh, continually confessing Christ and see supernatural things happen with the help of the Holy Spirit. I want to close with a verse in Acts chapter eight, 4. I want you to turn the same disciples which I gave the invitation today to be filled baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. But these same, some of the same ones in Acts chapter 4, I want you to see it. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, they prayed, because they were persecuted. In Acts 4, 29, they prayed, they asked the Lord, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that which with all boldness they may speak your word. Did you catch that? They're asking for boldness. They're asking for boldness. How many know we need supernatural boldness? We need supernatural boldness. I don't know about you, but you can get intimidated by unsaved people. How many know you've been intimidated? <laughs> and and the, sometimes the more educated they are, they get more intimidated, right? But you can get intimidated by unsaved people. So they said, Lord, grant with all boldness. They're asking for boldness. They're asking for supernatural boldness. Beloved, let me tell you something. You cannot, you cannot continually confess Christ to others without supernatural boldness. You can't do it. Because it's a supernatural thing. And the devil's going to fight against you. The flesh is going to fight against you. Principalities and powers are going to fight against you. I mean, all hell will come at you sometimes. So you need supernatural help. And with all boldness that you may speak your word, by stretching out that, that your hand to heal and signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. I love that. And when they had prayed, say, when they had prayed. We need more prayer, right? We need to pray more. The place where they were assembled together was shaken. That's the power of God, right? And they were all, what? Filled, these same disciples who were filled in Acts chapter 2, spoke in tongues. Now they got another filling, a different kind. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? And they spoke the word of God with what? That's what we need. We can confess Christ. It's a supernatural thing happening when you confess Christ. Uh, in different ways we confess him. Different ways we confess him. Last night, Saturday night, we had a Hindu woman come here in front of the church. Bobby talked to her. <laughs> Bobby talks to everybody. Uh, nobody leaves this church without getting the gospel. Amen, somebody. But Bobby talked to her, and then she came in, the, and I came later. I gave her a booklet before she left. So she got the gospel. She saw the love of God. But I'm telling you something. You think, oh, people are not going to... She looked hungry. She looked like she was seeking the truth. You don't know down deep. Somebody might say, I don't want to hear that. But down deep, they may want to hear it. Don't stop. Confess Christ. Ask the Lord to give you boldness in this area. We're in the last days. That person that you confess Christ to, the Lord can work supernaturally in that person's life. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
And they overcame him. I keep hearing that verse. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Are you confessing Christ? Are you confessing him on a regular basis? Is confessing Christ a lifestyle practice? Put it that way. Is confessing Christ to others, and sometimes it's confessing your testimony and how the Lord saved you. Sometimes it's confessing the love of God. Sometimes it's confessing the fear of God, uh, uh, what happens after life, after death. Sometimes it's confessing how good Christ is, but you're confessing him and the gospel, what he's done, however angle you use, you're confessing Christ to others. I'm not ashamed. Everybody say, I'm not ashamed. ashamed. Are you ashamed? Adult, are you ashamed? Teenager, are you ashamed? Child, are you ashamed? Older Christian, are you ashamed? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is. It is. What's the it is? The gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Wow. That's why the enemy wants us not to say anything. Because the power of God is on that message. Amen. It's not just any message. It's not a, a political message. Political messages are not the power of God. I thought you'd be giving a shout amen to me on that one. I said, I don't care what the political message, it's not the power of God. <laughs> no advertisement is the power of God. No political message is the power of God. Only the gospel is the power of God. Praise God. Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with boldness like that 15-year-old on the street corner preaching the gospel fearlessly, boldly, with God's love in his heart is the joy of the Lord, boldly preaching the gospel. Lord, give us that boldness in our everyday walk with Jesus. Let's stand on our feet. Thank you, Lord. We ask for a filling of the Holy Spirit for like Pentecostal. Now I'm asking you, have you been filled with a soul winning power, with a uh, power to witness and share Christ with others and confess him before others? Have, are, you, are you filled with boldness? Maybe you need another filling, right? <laughs> I need another filling. Lord, fill me with more boldness. If you sense that this is what you need, but maybe there's someone here that's never confessed Christ as personal Savior, never confessed Him openly. Everyone Jesus calls, He calls publicly. But you never confess Christ as your own personal Savior. Now I say to you, there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. I say to you, there's a real eternal heaven and there's a real eternal hell. And once you die, you're going to spend eternity either in a wonderful place called heaven or a terrible place of torment called hell. Which road are you on? If you're here this morning and you're not sure that you're on the road to heaven and you're not sure that Jesus is inside of you and you're not sure that you're saved, I want to pray. Give me the privilege to pray with you and for you. Would you raise your hand and surrender and say, Lord, I, give, I surrender to you, Jesus. I receive you now. Anybody in the house? that's not sure of their salvation. You may be in the church. People can be in the church for years and never be saved. Isn't that correct? Yes. Come on. We have to confess Christ openly, right? Amen. Pray with him. I want you to pray with me and pray with, pray with him too, all of us, to help him. You want to be saved, right? You want to know you're saved. Say this out loud to Jesus. Confess him now as your Savior and Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross, shed your blood for all my sins. And you rose again. And you're alive forever. I come to you, Jesus. 
for my salvation. Save me, Jesus. I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior and Lord now. Come into my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me now. And help me to live for you every day. In Jesus' name, I am saved. Praise the Lord. I want, you, I want you to go with my go with him. He's gonna give you some stuff. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. If you need Jesus, Christian, if you are not a confessing, confessing Christ regularly have, throughout the week, I want you to come and get filled with the Holy Spirit with power for boldness. You say, well, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit and I praise Him and that's wonderful, but you need another one. You need another, another kind of filling of the Holy Spirit. And that is to get boldness. 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 Only comes from the Holy Spirit. And with love. Love and boldness both. You come. Ask the Lord to fill you with boldness to confess Christ to your world. Your world. As we close the service today. I want you to do something. I want you to ask the Lord every day, just a little short phrase. A pastor told me once, ask the Lord for more love, more wisdom, and more power. So ask the Lord for more love, more wisdom, and when you say more power, say Lord, and more boldness to share Jesus with others. If you keep asking the Lord for boldness, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get boldness. <laughs> Holy boldness does not mean rudeness. You can be bold in love like that young boy, 15 years old. I keep thinking about him. Wow, did he challenge me. God bless him. Lord, keep blessing that young man. Lord, give us that holy boldness and holy love with it, like that young man preaching the gospel on the street corner. Wow. Lord, give us that holy love and holy boldness to do that to our world that we come in contact. Lord, we want those families here that are saved, and how many have unsaved, still unsaved family members, relatives, cousins, aunts, uncles that are not saved? Would you raise your hand? Look at this. You know what I challenge you? I challenge you to come on Saturday night and start praying for them. Amen. Start praying for them and then start witnessing to them and start sharing the gospel with them. Because 50 years from now, 75 years from now, they're going to be off in eternity. Somewhere. And we can make the difference. Can you imagine that? We have the remedy. Say, I have the remedy. In Jesus, I have the remedy. Thank you, Lord. We receive it today. We receive it by faith. In Jesus' name, give us somebody today. Give us somebody this week, Lord, to confess Christ. Whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father. He who denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father. That's pretty clear cut, isn't it? I want Jesus to confess me before the Father. How about you? Amen. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, help us this week, Lord, to be a blessing to somebody. In Jesus' name, amen. Walk with Jesus this week. Walk with Jesus and confess him to somebody this week. God bless. Remember our Wednesday night service. Amen. Thank you for watching the presentation from the New Life Christian Fellowship. We are located at 6235 West North Avenue, Oak Park, Illinois. For more information, call us at 708-848-2441. Thank you. May the Lord Jesus Christ truly bless you.